So welcome to Duo Tech Talks. Uh, this is our first meeting that we've had so far. We're gonna have many more on a monthly basis. Um, hopefully, uh, maybe not in such tight quarters, but um, we've cleared out the entire kitchen tonight to have you guys in. I think we've exceeded the official uh, capacity of this office, which I think is 49 people. Yep. Um, so if, you, if you're friends with the fire marshal, just don't let them know. Uh, so before we talk about um, the presentation that we have today, which is about some Android mobile security stuff that um, I presented, actually, coincidentally, at a conference that uh, Chris Valasek runs uh, called SummerCon. Um, if you haven't been to SummerCon or you're not involved in the security community, I definitely recommend it. It's one of the oldest hacker conferences ever. Um, it started in the 1980s before computer security was a big thing, and it was a bunch of like paranoid folks that got together and talked about UFOs. It's definitely evolved a little bit. Um, <laughs> now they talk about information security and um, it involves lots of drinking. So I'll kind of explain some of the stories that um, went along with this presentation because it was one of the most fun presentations I've ever given in my life. I was on stage literally crying from how much I was laughing while trying to give this talk. So there's some stories about this, our little Android pinata here that um, I'll be sure to share with you guys. Uh, I also thought this presentation was uh, relevant because Charlie, if you guys know Charlie Miller, he does a bunch of like iOS random stuff. He made like Mac batteries explode. He's very good at stunt hacking. You know, you'll see Charlie on like the Today Show or like CNN talking about like how he's, I don't know, done something really silly to something that you probably don't care about, but it makes a, a big, uh, big media hit. And that was our goal with this kind of uh, talk, at least maybe a smaller media hit. Um, but Charlie had done the research with Chris on the car hacking, and so I thought it was appropriate that since Chris wasn't here, I would step in and give my joint presentation with, uh, with Charlie, who's also not here. <laughs> uh, uh, unlike Dr. Valasek, which I think I might have included in uh, one of my emails, Dr. Miller and I are actually real doctors. Not medical doctors as we appear here, but uh, doctors of fake sciences and <laughs> mathematics from crappy schools like Notre Dame. <laughs> So um, what we were doing with this presentation was, um, uh, how many of you guys know about Android Bouncer? Three, four people? How many of you guys know about like an app store? Do you know what an app store is? Mobile apps, have you heard of Android? <laughs> What's Android? What's Android, it's like a robot. <laughs> um, actually, uh, so the, I, I forgot I had this in the presentation, but this was the, um, the introduction uh, at this conference that uh, it was more of a it was more of a, a show than a presentation. It's more of a performance uh, with the costumes and everything else. Um, what we had was a pinata that turned out um, you can get a pinata from anywhere. It turns out you can go to custompinatas.com and you point that at an image online and you say make a pinata out of this image. <laughs> <laughs> so this was this was their interpretation of the Android. <laughs> robot, which looks a little derpy to me. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, uh, a little off center, but um, <laughs> we ordered it. Um, I brought it uh, as a carry-on on the plane to New York, <laughs> and everyone thought I was extremely strange. Um, thankfully, one of the conference organizers had a Louisville slugger just like on hand, and um, this, this conference is at a bar, so there's not many places. a bar with like a small stage, and so we hung this pinata up, like just kind of like with a, a rope around like one of the rafters, probably pulling down like some light stage. I'm, I'm sure Martin would have flipped out if um, that was his equipment. Um, and it was also right next to the podium. So if this was the podium, the pinata was like hanging right here. And the idea was we're gonna fill up the pinata with like candy and people are gonna come up and hit it. Um, turns out we didn't bring candy. And so Charlie and I scrambling like five minutes before the presentation, we go to a gas station um, in Brooklyn somewhere and we're just pulling everything off the shelf. So we get like uh, gummy worms, you know, you're pulling all those like 99 cent candies off the shelf and gummy worms like um, uh, candy necklaces, um, applesauce, we got lots of mops applesauce that we stuffed in there. A few things of cup of noodles and ramen that we just kind of <laughs> jammed into there. And then we uh, finished it all off with a couple um, like tall boys in aluminum cans of like uh, steel reserve and some like malt liquor that we just you know stuffed into there. So it was a pinata full of junk of candy snacks and beer, apparently. 
Um, and the, the idea was uh, every few slides we'd give, we'd invite someone up on stage. And of course, the audio guys had a, a field day with this, and they were like playing mariachi music, and each person would come up. And Charlie and I would step away as they take a bat and swing like right near our laptops with this like hanging pinata and our laptops right there. Um, so it worked pretty well um, until a point where somebody hit the pinata and they busted one of the uh, tall boys of, of beer that was in there. <laughs> and so I started just spraying out the sides. <laughs> and this other guy comes up and swings with one hand, misses the pinata, hits the microphone on the, on the podium, which hits all of our beers that are stacked on the podium and fall like onto our laptops. And we're you know, drastically trying to save our laptops. Um, and so the, the pinata is completely soaked. The next guy comes up and swings, and the entire bottom half of the pinata rips off and goes flying, <laughs> like rows. And we're swinging towards the audience here, and it goes flying like five rows into the audience and like hits someone in the face with this like thing that we thought was full of like heavy objects, like full cans of beer. Uh, turns out it was just the bottom half of the pinata, but it was still a soaking wet, you know, paper mache <laughs> thing hitting someone in the face. And we're, we stopped the presentation. We're like, oh my god, is everyone okay? Is everyone okay? Um, Everyone was okay, and um, the pinata ended up in this enormous mess of goop on the floor. But I could barely make it through this presentation because I was, I was just, you know, laughing harder than I ever had in my life. Um, so that was the pinata. It was a lot of fun. We don't have that here today, unfortunately, um, or thankfully. I'm not sure if any of you guys want to be uh, sprayed with beer. Um, but we also had another stunt that was going on during this presentation, and it's related to the Android market. So if you guys are like security or networking guys, this is Wireshark, allows you to analyze traffic, it decodes traffic for you. Um, you guys are probably savvy tech mobile users. Um, you've probably used an Android device before. And what they used to call Google Play, or what they used to call the Android market is now Google Play. And all of the traffic that that application sent was over HTTP. So you'd launch the Android market app and it would pull down you know, all the assets needed to display um, the information within the application. And you could do searches. You could search, I want to download like the Chase banking app. And that request would go over HTTP. And the results would be returned over HTTP. Um, so what you could actually do was um, man in the middle that transport, um, and this all happens over protobuf, which is this crazy um, uh, you know, protocol format that's you know, highly uh, specialized and compressed for, it's kind of like ASN1, like uh, PER, if you've ever used that. Hopefully, if you're shaking your head, you probably have nightmares of PER and BER. Um, but it's, it's, it's made for um, kind of efficient uh, wire speed transfer of, of um, protocols. And if you, look, if you could speak the kind of protobuf format, you could inject your own application results into these searches. So you search for Chase, and you see a Chase result, and you click on that, and you go to install it. Turns out you're not installing the Chase app, but you're installing an app that has been uh, sort of delivered by a malicious attacker. Uh, so it was a very bad thing. Um, unfortunately, this was like back a few years ago, and uh, you know we had some fun with it when, when that was a, a vulnerability in, in the, the market app. But they've since kind of stepped it up and are finally using um, uh, HTTPS for those kind of sensitive transactions. However, um, switching to HTTPS has some performance constraints. People don't always protect everything. And so we wanted to have a little fun that um, if you're doing these sensitive transactions, like searching the app or browsing the app, it goes over HTTP. But all of the assets that are delivered, the images and some of the text and the screenshots, are actually delivered over HTTP still. So if you're on the same Wi-Fi network as someone or you're able to pull off a larger scale attack um, with some DNS cache poisoning or whatever else, um, you can still man in the middle of those connections. Um, and so at this conference, we had a um, sort of man in the middle proxy running that anyone who was on their phone and on the Wi-Fi would be delivered a different Google Play Store experience. <laughs> and that was uh, the Jono and Charlie App Store which, uh, this is one of the tame images that Charlie sent me when I said, hey Charlie, we should do this and put up funny pictures of us so that they display in the person's, on the person's phone when they're browsing the app store. And I, I got this email from him and I like, I deleted that email so quickly. I just, you know, Google like automatically display these attachments and I was like, oh my gosh. 
close. Um, so anyone who was browsing the App Store during uh, the presentation had a different, uh, different experience where all of the assets of the presentation were replaced with you know, the, the, the images of our choosing. Um, just kind of a, a, a goofy stunt, but um, it was fun. We never really open sourced it, but it was just a basic man in the middle proxy that was tailored to the App Store. So you would feed it whatever goofy images you wanted to replace, and it would know to resize them for the appropriate assets for kind of like promo things, large banners, you know, um, icons, screenshots, and you know, weirdo pictures of us wearing funny hats or masks or whatever else. <laughs> Anyway, so now that we've got that intro over, um, we can actually talk about the real presentation that we gave, um, which was about the Android Bouncer framework um, from Google. So I'm going to talk about a couple different topics here. Um, the first of is just an introduction to Google Bouncer. So um, any of you guys that use um, you know, modern mobile devices and there's a lot of debates over iOS versus Android in terms of security. What do you guys think is the more secure app store, just from your own experiences or what you've heard? iOS. Yeah. And why is that? Because it's uh, curated. It's curated? It's curated, so at least uh, stoppage goes in, and there's only one app store which is there. That's Unlike true. Uh, Android, where you potentially could download from anywhere. So there's lots of regional and third-party Android app stores that don't go through the same process as the main Android app store. Um, but if we're looking at you know, just the Google Play versus iOS app store, um, that is the, the um, sort of very um, um, uh, sort of embedded public opinion that iOS goes through curation. And developers see that, the public sees that. Um, developers get their apps rejected because they're not popping up the right dialogues. Um, it's not user friendly. But when you think about it from a security perspective, what is that? What is actually happening during that review process? You know, you submit an app. It takes seven days to get reviewed, and then finally goes into the market. You submit an app to Google. It takes you know maybe a few minutes to an hour. I don't know what the current uh, sort of lag is these days, but it takes um, much less time. So people inherently think. That's less secure. You know, someone's looking at my app, a human is looking at my app in iOS, and they're curating it. They're like, you know, playing around with it and like, you know, clicking on buttons, and they're like, oh, it's, it's secure. You know, like, this app is not doing bad things because it has UI and pretty pictures. Um, turns out most of the security controls that you'd like to place on an app store are not things a human would be able to detect anyway. They're things that are under the covers. It's not something that, um, a UI guy could look at and say, well, this app is doing bad stuff or this app is doing good stuff. Um, it's things that are automated, um, whether they're um, so-called static analysis, where you're kind of looking at the app that's submitted just at, like, I upload the package, and I'm just going to tear apart that package and look at what the app might do, um, versus dynamic analysis, which is also automated. But it might say, I'm going to run the app, and I'm going to observe what it does at runtime. And hey, if it's taking my address book and it's sending it off to the internet, that might be bad. Could be good, could be bad. There's certainly some apps that do legitimate actions like that, like, oh, share your, all your contacts with LinkedIn when you sign up. I don't think many people intend to do that, but once in a while you click the wrong button when you log in and suddenly everyone's blasted with a LinkedIn invite from you. So what Bouncer was assigned to do um, was to uh, kind of shore up a lot of the um, both perceived and actual uh, weaknesses of the Android market such that um, it would test applications um, in a sort of dynamic analysis environment and determine, try to determine whether they're good or bad. And so this was a piece of the blog post that they put out. It said, performs a set of analysis on new applications already in the market and ones that are new submitted. Um, applications upload, starts analyzing it for known malware, blah, blah, blah looks for behaviors, keyword, that might indicate an application might be misbehaving, compares against previous analyzed apps to detect red flags. We actually run every application on Google's infrastructure and simulate how it will be run on the Android device to look for hidden malicious behavior. So if a human's reading this, or <laughs> not a human, but a normal person, this sounds pretty good. When I read this, I say, oh, Google's doing dynamic analysis. They're taking virtualized um, Android devices 
and they're running an app inside of it, and they're instrumenting that device, and they're seeing what happens at runtime. And this is a, a very well-known problem, as Jose in the audience is, is very well versed in uh, sort of malware analysis on the desktop world. So if I give you an EXE or a, a I don't know, a, what a, a, a binary on a, a Mach O binary on OS X or an ELF binary on Linux, and I tell you, is this going to be good or bad? You can look at that binary in great depth. You can uh, disassemble it, you can analyze it, but what you might actually do is, is run it and see again what kind of operations it performs at runtime. If it's you know, RMing your hard drive, if it's making network connections out to um, command and control servers, um, you know, downloading additional payloads that might be trying to exploit your platform. Um, this is a very common problem in computer security where you don't know um, what something is going to do. And even if you do run it, you have all these constraints around how long you run it, what environment it's running in, can that environment be fingerprinted. Um, so when, I, when Charlie and I looked at this, we are like, oh, this is going to be, it's going to be a, a walk in the park. Like, this is, this is easy stuff. Um, but we still want to have fun because it was a new environment. Um, sort of malware analysis and the measures and countermeasures and counter countermeasures is very well understood. Um, but this was a first kind of application um, to mobile devices. And in security, if you want to do something that's cool, it's like, well, we did that for like 20 years, but now it's on mobile, so it's really cool. Uh, so that's what we wanted to do here. Any questions so far? I need one question to continue on. <laughs> there we go. Why don't these malware things just sleep for a couple of days? That's an interesting question. And we'll get to that. You've already found one way to bypass Google Bouncer. Yeah. Not very difficult. Of the You're getting time. too complicated. <laughs> That's the easy way. So yeah, this is what we're kind of getting into here. It's not really difficult to bypass Bouncer. Um, and so it's not to say that you know, Google's approach is completely flawed. It's just a very difficult problem. And again, it's kind of a well understood problem in the malware analysis space. Um, but we wanted to kind of just you know, tear through a bunch of these ways that we could actually fingerprint the bouncer system. Um, simply because if you can fingerprint it and you know that your application is executing within bouncer, if you're a malicious actor, you simply don't evoke your malicious behavior if you're running a bouncer and you pretend, you play nice. And then once you're running on a real device, you do bad stuff and you've evaded bouncer um, for that perspective. So we're not going to have piñatas. There might be some mystery and intrigue. I can't promise that. Um, but we do have beer, so good stuff. So we kind of asked ourselves, you know, this is um, not, not necessarily an academic approach, but it was how, do we, how would we design a system? And as it turns out, um, uh, a former U of M alumni um, or alum, um, Niels Provost, who has a long history at, at U of M, a long history in computer security, um, he was one of the original authors of, of SSH and a lot of other sort of core uh, open BSD tools and um, systems that we all sort of take for granted today. Um, was actually on the Google team that was um, uh, sort of responsible for implementing Bouncer. So knowing Niels, I was like, well, you know, if I was Niels, here's how I would design a system. And here's all the questions I would ask as an adversary kind of going after um, Bouncer. You know, what does it use? Um, does it have any sort of filters of what apps it analyzed? Um, how can we actually get these accounts to start kind of probing the system? Um, if my application is offered network access at runtime, what happens? Is it complete open network access? Like I can call out to any network service? Is it filtered with some whitelist or blacklist? Is it emulated where, you know, maybe, um, I can, my application thinks I can call it to the network, but in reality I'm calling out to some other Google proxy um, that's emulating some network service. And you know, what, is it, what is it running in? Um, what kind of timing might there be? How long does it run? Which was a, a good point that uh, you pointed out there. Um, and then there's all of these kind of bigger questions of like, okay, if I submit an app to uh, Android and it's trying to emulate my app's functionality, what is it doing? Is it like, fuzzing the inputs? Is it pushing buttons for me? Is it, you know, inputting things in the text fields and trying to exercise different uh, program space of that application? Um, and also, what is it trying to detect? You know, is it, is it looking for, what kind of malicious activity is it looking for and is it going to find anything that I might be doing or can I evade it in some way? 
So um, the first thing that was necessary was actually we we're going to try this out. You know, just go straight to the metal and um, see what we can do. So I don't know if you guys have seen the wire at all. Good show. Um, in the wire, they use things called burners, um, which are disposable cell phones for drug deals, not for Google Play accounts. But as it turns out, we needed some as well. Um, and so we kind of took it to the extreme. We thought, hey, what would we do if we were real attackers? And we want to stay completely anonymous in the submission process. So we get a bunch of cash, and we would go to you know, a CVS, um, hopefully not near our house. And so I actually drove to like Lake Orion um, to go to a CVS. <laughs> and uh, you know, put on a, a baseball cap and to avoid any cameras in there. Bought some prepaid cell phones, brought some uh, you know, prepaid Visa cards, and um, got some you know, free EC2 micros, um, you know, signed up via you know, anonymous VPN proxies. We were just going to the absolute extreme, mostly because we didn't want to get our own accounts banned, um, but we also just wanted to do a thought experiment of how would someone actually do this in an anonymous fashion. Um, so if you sign up for a new Google account these days, usually they'll tie it to a, um, or they'll have SMS verification. This isn't Google's two-step verification, which also is a good topic that Adam should talk about because he broke it uh, a few months ago, or maybe about, I guess, a year ago now. Where did Adam go? He's gone. Um, but even if you sign up for a Gmail account, they still need to tie it to some phone number, which is why we bought the sort of cell phone burners I mean, in order to receive this SMS and type it in, and that was a waste of you know, 20 bucks for a, a stupid track phone, but serve its purpose. Um, then when we went to uh, register for uh, the Google Play Store, they do charge you money. And it's kind of a token amount. It's like 20, 30 bucks. Um, but mostly they do this because you have to go through Google Checkout, or what's known as Google Wallet. And there's a whole load of fraud analytics that is involved in Google Checkout, um, where that's kind of their, their first barrier to entering the app store is that you have to have a clean identity and a clean sort of uh, payment instrument in order to submit apps. And so our registration actually got denied because we were using these fake credit cards, these prepaid credit cards. So if you try to use one of those prepaid credit cards, you get flagged. Um, the cool thing was we didn't actually have to pay for our registration to submit apps. So the way the Android market works is that you can upload applications all you want. You can't actually publish them to the Android market without completing registration. But as it turns out that um, with Bouncer is that you don't have to publish an application and have it analyzed by Bouncer. So it actually worked out really well for us where we didn't want to publish applications because we didn't want to put people at harm with our malicious apps that we were submitting. Um, and we also didn't want to pay for it, so we could just upload applications, Bouncer would analyze it, and we would get the results back um, and from, our, from our sort of probes, and we didn't have to pay a dime for it. Um, so it worked out really well, and it's kind of a loophole that I think they have now fixed. Um, this was Charlie's account, Google Players Club at Yahoo.com. Um, Charlie's not very stealthy when he signs up for accounts. He has this like... Like, I think the username here, oh, this one was Players Club, but he signed up another one, just Charlie Miller, um, <laughs> which he's fairly infamous for mobile security research. So, like, when he signed up for, he also got banned from the iOS app store, and he had signed up just with his name, Charlie Miller. And I was like, any app store should have a trigger that if Charlie Miller signs up, you just flag that account or you pay special attention to it because you're going to get embarrassed like six months later. <laughs> So um, what we started with was just a very simple application. All it did was phone home to our command and control server, um, which is just a, a colo box that I had. So it would just make a network connect out to our, um, our application. And since we are doctors, we have, of course, the Hippocratic Oath. Um, we didn't want to sort of harm innocent bystanders. So we put like descriptions in the application, like don't install this, which probably would cause people to want to install it even more. And we can also define like, oh, it must run on an Android phone that has like six LCD screens and like, you know, a forward, backward, and sideways facing camera. And like, you know, <laughs> those aren't real things, but you know, we made it so that it would never be available to a real functioning Android device out there. And we put like, you know, again, Charlie's kind of like stupid icon here and player's club description. So that if people actually did um, come across it, they, you know, hopefully wouldn't install it. 
Um, and then this was the process that you, know, you actually go to upload your APK, you fill in the metadata if you've ever submitted an Android um, application in the past, it might look familiar, it might look different, I don't know if the interface has changed that much. Um, and as soon as we hit this, oops, as soon as we, ah, as soon as we hit this save button, oh my gosh, as soon as we hit the save button here, um, wherever it is, up here in the corner, uh, we saw this request come in. And if you don't know, this is just like a, um, you know, this slash 16 is a, a Google CIDR block. And we're like, oh, wow, we just got a, a callback from our application, um, which, you know, this is the first application we submitted. So we were kind of surprised that, oh, there's completely unfiltered network access. We just made an HTTP request out. We made a GET with the ID, and this is like the Android ID of the phone. And we had a little web server running on our command and control server. And we said, oh, wow, like, Android ran our app and it ran our app like almost immediately. And like we hit save and then we switched to like another terminal and then we noticed that this request had come in. Um, and it had, you know, of course, again, actually ran this app before it was published to the, the market, um, just when we saved it and uploaded it initially. So that was kind of our first foray into Bouncer. We, we had submitted something, we knew that it was running in this dynamic analysis environment. The next step was to actually uh, kind of fingerprint this. Um, so at a very high level, um, after we started poking around, we kind of determined, one, we knew this was going to be dynamic analysis. Um, it was a full sort of emulated Android environment. So if you guys have ever done, how many people have done like Android development before? Wow, a lot of people. So when you're testing your app, you don't like run it on your phone usually. You usually run it in an emulator. And this was a very similar environment that was um, executing these applications. And um, as you said in the back, uh, this application was only run for five minutes. So you know, we did a couple tests where we're like, oh, we're just gonna make network requests in a looping fashion every five seconds, and then it would cut off at five minutes every time. And this would all be coming from you know, Google controlled IP addresses. We'd see some different IPs, but it was mostly the same sort of net block uh, owned by Google. And of course, we saw that you know, network access was available. So again, you know, we said, hey, if we can fingerprint the environment, um, we can pretend to be a benign application when running in Bouncer, and then we can do our really bad stuff if we're actually on a real device. So what we found was the underlying system was exactly the same as your development environment. It was a QEMU-based emulator. Um, it had all the same like, system properties, like if you run like a git prop or a set prop on Android, you can see like, um, kind of all of the uh, address space properties of um, the system. Um, and there's also a lot of different uh, sort of attributes of an Android device. There's all of the like hardware sensors, there's a camera, there's an accelerometer, there's GPS, and there's a lot of data sources too, like who's in your address book, what kind of SMSs are in your inbox, what kind of photographs are in your uh, camera app, what kind of files are on your SD card. Um, and then there's kind of like the environmental considerations, like what IP address is it coming from? Um, what is, can we perform any hardware attacks or timing attacks based on like, well, this is an emulated device versus a real device. And can we also play any tricks with kind of the um, input automation from the, um, the bouncer system? So again, there's like a thousand ways that you can sort of fingerprint bouncer. Um, some of the low hanging fruit are things like Oh, you look at the proc CPU info file. This tells you what kind of um, architecture or CPU you're running on. And it's called Goldfish. And Goldfish, if you are a really low-level Android developer, you know that's the uh, CPU architecture for what the emulator runs on. That's kind of the, the board um, that they define for that. Um, you can also just call uh, git prop on this property read only that kernel, that QEMU, which will tell you whether you're running in QEMU or not. So if you're a malicious app, you only want to run when QEMU equals false, equals zero. You don't want to execute your malicious payload when you're running in an emulated environment, not only because of Bouncer, but also because other malware analysts might be running your apps in an emulated environment trying to figure out what your app does, and you just want to avoid all of that. Um, there's also other fingerprints of QEMU, files that hang around, um, in, in directories like sys. Um, but all these things are kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, not only for the attacker, but also for the defender. If you're a defender and you want to design a better environment, a better bouncer, you kind of fix up all these things. Like you 
get rid of this file, and you make this return you know, uh, zero instead of one, and you change this to say um, you know, arm EABI v6. Um, and so you might want to take a more advanced approach, and this is something that some researchers did, where um, they fingerprinted the QEMU software environment based on QEMU emulating hardware in one way in real hardware sort of operating in a different fashion. So kind of like software where you don't know, like GCC and the C standard have very um, sort of interesting undefined behavior in certain environments. Hardware also actually has undefined or unspecified behavior. If you look at like the Intel manual, there's corner cases where it's like, oh, if you do this, the, you know, the, the results are undefined. And different implementations of the hardware, whether it's a real processor or it's a software emulated processor, can react differently. So you can actually fingerprint what uh, version of QEMU might be running. So kind of looking at just a high level, um, this is kind of a comparison between the bouncer environment and what a normal phone might look like. So that's my Galaxy Nexus. Um, that is Bouncer's environment. Interestingly enough, Bouncer was emulating a T-Mobile device, a T-Mobile MyTouch 3G, um, and that was actually the only device that we saw emulated. So um, every time our app ran in Bouncer, it always ran on this MyTouch 3G environment. Um, and you can see that the, um, the host, um, the build host that it was running on was you know, sort of anomalous there, but lots of the other um, sort of uh, metadata around the device looked like it could be um, a legitimate device. So they did do some stuff that, they gave it some fake strings to make it um, not really uh, horribly obvious that it was an emulator. Um, but if you start looking at uh, some of the deeper level attributes, you can see that, oh look, the, um, the phone number of the device, if you're an application, you can query what phone number the device is, is not the same as the emulator, but it is a you know, 555 number. Um, so you know that's not a, a real device that it's probably running on. And um, the device number um, and the serial number um, were actually the, the, um, the same on subsequent runs. So you know, if, you, if you were able to fingerprint this exact device ID, um, then you would know that you were running in Bouncer. Again, it was different from the emulator, but also since it didn't change, um, it was fairly obvious uh, what environment it was. So this was the, the static ID that the, the emulator returned. Um, we did some longer term testing. Um, by longer term, I mean like a couple weeks later. And um, it turned out that as we were starting this testing, they were continuing to evolve the Bouncer framework. And so they started actually randomizing this and changing it um, depending on which app we submitted and which account we submitted it from. So there were some, some interesting things that were going on while we were doing this testing. Um, but uh, Again, we're just kind of looking at these high-level attributes. As you get more into the kind of application level of the device, uh, if you guys have Android devices, you know you associate it with a Google account. And that Google account is usually you know, your own identity. When you first run the device and it says you have an existing Google account that you want to log in, you log in with Google and then it associates with your calendar and your email and all the other wonderful services probably a real device would have some sort of association. And so Google decided to attach it to this one account. Um, so we were able to query this from our you know, malicious app that we submitted. And the uh, Google account that it was associated with was called milescarlson at gmail.com. Um, and we did a bunch of Googling and we looked for like, people named Miles Carlson that worked at Google. Turns out it was just a completely made up name, um, <laughs> which is probably not a surprise. I don't think any kind of you know, engineers wanted to put their name into to Google Bouncer. Um, but so we wanted to see, like, you know, well, okay, we know it belongs to Miles. Like, who does Miles like? So we tried to exfiltrate the contact book. You know, the next step would be, well, let's look at other data sources on the phone, like the, the address book. And there was only one person in the contact book, and that was Michelle K. Levin, another fake name. And um, so, we, you know, we're looking, we're doing Google image searches, we're looking all over, like, who are these people? Are these, like, you know, funny names that they've used? Maybe it's an inside joke, an Easter egg that they left. Um, but we decided to email Michelle and, uh, <laughs> and Miles because we're doing this research and we're like, you know, we should probably give Google, like, a heads up. 
And so I sent this email saying, Michelle, it's been so long since we've talked. How are things? Charlie and I are doing well. We're very happy together. Uh, I hope to see you in New York, which is where the conference was. XOXO, Jono. Um, never, never received a response. Um, as we found out later, they actually did receive this email. Um, it was a, a honeypot address set up, so if they received any, any you know, automated spam to this, they know it would be tied back to some sort of um, application that was futzing around with, with Bouncer, um, but never a, a human response. Um, so uh, since we didn't get a response, we started signing up Michelle K11 <laughs> to a bunch of um, uh, uh, email lists, like full disclosure, which is a very noisy security-related email list. Um, so hopefully um, we threw some noise into the Google signal-to-noise ratio with that, uh, some of our subscriptions. Um, another thing we looked at is what's on the SD card. And this is still the thing that will haunt me to this day. The first image that we saw was cat.jpg. And I really wanted cat.jpg. I wanted to see what crazy cat picture they placed on the device. Because this was obviously some sort of you know, honey tokens and um, uh, sort of Easter eggs. Because they had Lady Gaga on there. And Lady Gaga 300.jpg, that was a specific enough file name that um, I could list that file on the SD card and I could see the exact file size and the file name. So I was able to find this Lady Gaga picture that matched that file name and that image size on Google Images. So I was very confident that was the, um, that was the file. The trick here was if you touched any of these files, if you ran the open system call on any of these files on the SD card, Bouncer would immediately flag your app and it would shut off the, the process and the execution. So these really were um, sort of honeypots that if you touch this passwords.txt file, you know, you're a malicious attacker and you're looking through the SD card on someone's device to try to grab interesting files like pictures of them or passwords.txt sounds pretty interesting, I'm gonna grab that. Um, they will flag your app immediately. So I wasn't really excited about passwords.txt or this random you know, camera image or I knew the Lady Gaga one, but cat.jpg, I really wanted that. <laughs> and I knew the file size and I knew the file name, but cat.jpg, I mean, how many cat JPEGs are there on the internet? <laughs> and so I spent a long time trying to get this off the device in many different ways. Um, we tried to escalate privileges on the device, which it allowed us to, but it also flagged our app. We were trying to root the device so that we could bypass any of the kind of, um, if they had done kernel level instrumentation to block us from retrieving this file. And we tried all sorts of different ways of reading that off the file system, invoking other parts of the Android framework to cause um, legitimate applications to read it off and send it over the network. But this was instrumented um, kind of at the, the, the um, emulator and file system level such that if we ever touched it at all, um, you know, we would be, we'd be flagged and out of luck. So to this day, I've never seen cat.jpg, <laughs> despite our communication with the Android security team and me begging them, can I just, can you please send me, <laughs> just send me, <laughs> send me the picture. Uh, I'm, sure it's a, I'm sure it's an awesome cat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would just ruin my hopes and dreams. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, Bouncer comes from this IP address range, the slash 16 owned by Google. Um, we started seeing some other ranges um, later in our testing, um, but I think the most interesting one was um, this other range. And this is like more of like a, a Google corporate range. Um, and so after we started you know, doing some more um, deep instrumentation and, and um, sort of probing of the Bouncer system, we started getting our accounts flagged and our application submissions flagged. And that was, um, it took a while to actually get to that point, but we were really excited when we did because we got to see like what happens next. And so we still had all of these kind of callback mechanisms built in and all these URLs that we were hitting um, on our command and control server. But then we would see like, these callbacks um, that came in from this IP address range. And at this point, we had like a full kind of um, a connect back shell such that you know, we'd run the app, it would call out to us, we'd be able to execute shell commands that would be sent to the device and it would return the output. So it was an interactive shell that we had built um, just over to HTTP transport. Um, so we were actually able to sort of interact with the device as opposed to just like hard coding a command and then sending it there and just more efficiency. We started getting requests to this from this to our callback server um, from the same IP range 
And we could tell that they were, they were um, sent by a, a manual uh, sort of request. Like different user agent, different IP address, different frequency. It wasn't actually following any of the execution patterns of a program. And so we, we found out that this was actually a human that was reviewing this. So after an app gets flagged, it goes to an analyst who then takes apart the app manually and looks at like, oh, this app is calling out to this weird service. I'm going to execute a GET request and see like, if it delivers a malicious payload or something else. But it's actually Charlie and I on the other end typing. <laughs> and so <laughs> after we got a few of these, we started typing and we kind of like realized that we started typing messages being like, hello, are you there? And of course they had no chance to respond, but we were just trying to you know, communicate one way with this, this person, be like, we know you're looking at our app. <laughs> um, so we never actually found out who had, who had analyzed that, but we, uh, we did have some friends on the team um, that, that did confirm that uh, there was a, a human on the other end of those, those commands that we sent. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that you can do um, to bypass Bouncer. The obvious thing is don't do anything bad for five minutes. Um, Bouncer only runs your app for five minutes, so just sleep for five minutes. And that's a decent defense, um, or a, a defense for an attacker, I should say, and maybe an offense. Um, in that, you know, you'll evade Bouncer, but if you're installed on a real device, you can afford to wait five minutes. It's not a big deal. You know, you wait five minutes, then you compromise the user device. Oh my gosh, so horrible. Um, but you can, Bouncer could adjust. Bouncer could say, we're gonna run it for 30 minutes, and you could say, oh, I'm gonna sleep for 30 minutes. Bouncer could say, I'm gonna wait for a week, and you could say, I'm going to sleep for a week. But at that point, you're kind of on the winning end of that equation. Um, Google's not gonna run this app for a week, because they're getting hundreds and thousands of app submissions every, you know, every day, they would just be backlogged with um, sort of all of these, these application requests. So in that scenario, the uh, advantage is definitely on the side of the attacker in terms of kind of playing the waiting game. Um, also, there are some interesting timing attacks given that you know, Bouncer is emulating a CPU. So if I can run um, sort of performance critical code or I can try to take advantage of CPU um, accelerated extensions of the ARM architecture like Neon or Thumb, I can tell whether I'm running on hardware or I'm running on software. And I can say, well, if I'm running on hardware, it's a real device, I'm gonna attack it if I'm running on software. It's an emulated um, environment, so I'm not gonna do bad activity. Um, the other thing we found out that Bouncer actually does explore the application space by clicking on UI elements and kind of emulating user input. So we saw that like when we popped up dialogues in our um, application, Bouncer would like click OK on that dialogue, or they click like the positive button of that dialogue, probably because lots of apps, you know, pop up a EULA to begin, and you want to click on that positive button, not the negative button, the OK versus the cancel, in order to elicit further behaviors from the application. Um, and this is completely predictable. So like you could have something that pops up that says click cancel to continue, and Bouncer would click OK, and you wouldn't execute your malicious payload, but a user would click Cancel, and then you would you know, do bad things. Um, so this was just like very basic. We had figured out, you know, wow, we can fingerprint it a bunch of different ways. Um, we wanted to kind of have a little bit of fun with it. Um, we posted this video, um, which actually showed our um, Connect Back shell and kind of you know, bouncing through some of the Bouncer environments. Um, we actually did get caught a couple times and had our medical license revoked. Um, <laughs> this was when um, it was really it was really dumb, and it was I blame Charlie for this. But uh, we had used our fake credit cards, and Charlie was like, "Well, this sucks. You know, why don't we just use a real credit card to sign up?" And so, not only did he use his real credit card, but he also signed up from his home IP address, and it was already associated with one of the accounts that we were messing around with. FuManchu719 at gmail.com. And so he got banned immediately. And that's not such a bad thing. I mean, you get your Fu Manchu account banned. Not a big deal. But Google's not dumb. They understand how attackers work. They understand the kind of resource constraints of attackers. It's not just ban one account and end of day. They kind of taint all the attributes of that account. So Charlie's home IP address was tainted, and his credit card was tainted, and his billing address. So the next day when his wife tried to make a purchase on Google Checkout, she also had her account banned. 
because she was coming from the same IP address and she was using a payment instrument that was, uh, had a similar billing address to the credit card that he had used. Um, and so not only was her, um, it was completely unrelated to Google Play, it was her Google checkout account, so she can't buy anything from Google anymore. Um, similarly, um, I don't know if I talk about this later or now, but um, I was banned from Google Play as well. Um, this is after we got caught. Um, but they've also banned me from Google Checkout. All of my accounts and all of my various credit cards I've had over the years. So I can't even buy new Android devices. I think one time Adam had to buy me <laughs> a new Nexus phone. And I was like, I'll write you a check because I can't use Google Checkout anymore. Um, since then, I've been able to obtain another account which I use solely for Google Checkout to be able to buy things for Google. I'm like, Google, I will give you money and you give me things, goods and services, and this is how commerce works. I'm not going to do anything terribly bad. Um, but like when I log into Google Checkout, it's like, your account has been you know, flagged for fraud. Please complete this you know, crazy form where you fax in your passport and like, you, know, you, perform, you, you provide like your uh, bank statements and stuff. I've gone through that process and they've still replied and been like, you have a alert on your account that means that we cannot reinstate it like regardless of whatever you provide. So it's just a lifetime ban, no big deal. Um, I can still use Gmail, which is awesome. And um, most of the rest of Google services, I just can't give them money, which is weird. Uh, so I have multiple lifetime bans from uh, Android App Store. Charlie has the record because he has lifetime bans from both Android and iOS. So we have this competition, like who can get the most lifetime bans from uh, various, various stores. Um, so yeah, I already talked about this. You know, we, we had some commands that were sent from a human. Um, yeah, this is when Charlie got banned. Uh, what actually happened here? I'm not sure which slide I talk about on this. No, uh, probably not. Um, it was actually our own fault. Like we were trying to be sneaky, but then we kind of screwed up where the command and control server that we were running, um, you know, ideally I talked about like you spin up an EC2 micro instance and you know it's untrackable. Um, I run a IRC server for a bunch of my friends called bustacati.org, and we were using that because it's just like my colo box and it was really easy. I didn't have to like do any extra work. Um, so we, we phoned home to that server. One of my friends who logs into that IRC server very frequently works for the Android security team. And when they were reviewing one of these apps that got flagged, they were looking at the host name that it phoned home to. And he's like, oh, Bustacati, that's John's server. And that's how they caught us. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always the, you know, the, the stupid stuff um, that, gets you, that gets you flagged or caught. Um, if we had not been so lazy, um, we could have been more, more productive. But at that point, we had already performed all the analysis we wanted to do. And it wasn't um, that big of a deal. Um, but uh, it, it is telling that, you know, that there's still like a human element to it. And that's how they ended up catching this attacker. If we had been more stealthy, then maybe some of their bans wouldn't have been uh, quite as effective. So um, other things that we were playing with, and this is just completely on security, not, not related to security at all, um, but there's like, People call it parasitic computing. It's like, you give me resources to do something, I'm going to abuse those resources. If you give them to me for free, um, I'm going to you know, leverage them into some non-free monetary value. So one example of this was um, Amazon has a, uh, I don't know if they fixed this yet, but um, uh, I heard it at another conference, so it's public knowledge. Um, they have a uh, distributed computing platform. It's like MapReduce. It's like Hadoop for Amazon. I forget what it's called. Is it Amazon MapReduce? Elastic MapReduce. Oh, is it Elastic MapReduce? Okay. Um, you pay for that. You pay for the service, but they give you a setup period. They give you like an hour to like upload your data, and then you do the MapReduce process. Turns out when that initial uh, bootstrapping process is happening, you can SSH to that box that they're spinning up for that, that MapReduce process and run whatever commands you want for an hour. So you get like a free hour of compute time, um, which you, know, you might be able to do something interesting with if you have a, a computing load that you want to do this and abuse the service. Um, we were more restricted. We had five minutes of running our app on Google's you know, computing resources. You upload an application, it runs it, and it terminates it. But you know, why not uh, use that free computing resources that they've given to us or you know, $20, depending on if you pay the registration fee or not. 
Um, we wanted to use it for security purposes. So are you guys familiar with like fuzzing at all? Like you provide a malformed input to um, some sort of program and you see if it, it crashes or it has some security exceptions or it behaves poorly on that, that malformed input. So we wanted to, it's very common to like fuzz um, browsers or image parsers or whatever else. We wanted to fuzz Android on the Android platform using Android Bouncer. So it was like ultra meta fuzzing, um, a self, self fuzzer, a self fizzer. So what we did was we uploaded an application that would pull down from the network um, randomly generated uh, PNG files and it would load them within the Android browser running within Bouncer and see if um, the Android browser would crash and then send us, if it did crash, send us a, a crash log of those details. Um, again, totally stupid, you could run this on your own computer um, and it would be much faster and more efficient, but we wanted to abuse you know, Google's uh, you know, free resources and free computing power. So we ran a bunch of this and you know, nothing really happened. <laughs> it's just for you know, shits and giggles. Um, the other thing was we wanted to trick Bouncer into agreeing to end user licensing agreements because everyone hates those things. So we're like, hey, what if we can ask Google um, to run services um, or to run an application and agree to our, our end user license agreement? So we, we would put like a EULA in the app that said like, you, are agree, you agree you are not Bouncer and we knew that Bouncer would click yes to it and then we can then file our lawsuit against Bouncer uh, for being a, a liar. Um, we also had that in some of our other um, applications just so that if anyone ran it, um, they would at least have a fair warning. Um, there's other things we can do um, with Bouncer that are, are more sophisticated. Um, Bouncer can of course be performing static analysis, which can be looking for certain signatures within the application to say, hey, it looks like you have an embedded exploit payload or it looks like you are running a shell um, process, which might be unusual for a normal application. But static analysis is you know, fairly easy to um, sort of bypass and, and um, evade, even more so than dynamic analysis in most cases. Um, another one of the things that we didn't look too deeply in, but we saw was present, was uh, taint propagation. So a lot of these um, applications might do something that's pseudo-legitimate or um, sort of questionable, like the example I gave where you take a contact address book and you ship it over the network. That might be an, an action or a behavior that you want to flag. But how do you know that that happened? If I am an application and I query the address book, I take your address book, I put it into a big buffer in C or in Java, and then I send that buffer, I encrypt it or I base64 encode it, and I send it over the network interface. How do I know that was actually the contact address book? That's where taint tracking comes in. You're actually able to taint memory and say that this memory came from a certain source that I want to track, and no matter what my program does to it, anywhere that memory gets touched will also be tainted, and then if any tainted bytes end up being sent uh, via a, a network system call or over the network interface, then you can flag that. So no matter if I encrypt it or munge it through some things or like cut off everything but the first letter of the person's name in the contact address book, you can still actually find um, uh, that, that sort of path was taken with that information flow. Uh, but there's also all sorts of interesting ways in a Java environment and also with an emulator to disrupt that taint tracking. Um, so we tried some things, but um, we didn't really go too deeply there. But there's all these like native uh, JNI um, buffers that you can invoke and other ways that you can try to reflect information off a system call and get it back to kind of um, stop that, that taint tracking, that memory taint tracking from being effective. Um, so some of the, on the other side, some of the challenges that we had was like, hey, how much time do we have to do this? How much effort do we want to put in from Charlie and I's side? We were doing all this like a few weeks before the SummerCon presentation, like all good researchers do. You submit your talk, you don't do any work until it gets accepted, and then you scramble like, you know, 10 minutes before the presentation. Um, it was also hard because we didn't have the cleanest feedback loop from Google. You'd think that, you know, you submit an app, sometimes it just wouldn't run. Other times, like, We'd see other weird behavior, or you know, we start seeing things from other IP addresses, and it was hard to get that that kind of very clean feedback loop. Um, so that's actually one way that Google can really frustrate attackers is by performing randomized analysis or you know other kinds of um, sort of uh, non-deterministic activity that makes it more difficult for an attacker to analyze that environment. Um, 
we did test some of the static analysis. Um, like we took an off-the-shelf exploit called Rage in the Cage. Um, it ran in Bouncer. We were able to escalate privileges, but you know, I'm guessing that was flagged. We didn't know for sure um, whether that was associated with a, a manual review process. Um, but we were kind of surprised that like it didn't immediately halt execution. So they, they still wanted to allow the exploit to run because they wanted to see what it did after it got root privileges, after it escalated privileges, to learn more about like what attackers are doing or to you know, fingerprint other um, privilege escalation exploits that might not be off the shelf like Rage in the Cage was. Um, yeah, other static analysis that we fingerprinted, if you, if you supply, like, this was an example of like, you know, um, Google was looking for system slash system slash bin in any APKs that were submitted, and they would flag those. Um, very simplistic, like you probably shouldn't be executing something from there if you're a legitimate app, but if you're a malicious app, you might leverage something um, from there. Um, but at the same time, like if you're a programmer or you're writing code in Java or C or whatever else, you can take this string, which is a signature, and obfuscate it. Like you could say, um, I want the string to be slash sy, and then another part of the string be ste, and then like you know just chop it up or encode it or encrypt it. And static analysis is not going to be able to determine that when at runtime the string is reconstructed, it equals this. So that's kind of the, the limitation of, of static analysis. Talked about taint tracking. Skip that. Um, there's all these different ways that we tried to disrupt um, taint tracking. Some of them were. Um, more effective than others. Um, again, a lot of these things are common, like using the shared preferences. Like we'd pull data from the address book, stuff it in the shared preferences, take it back out, and then send it over the network, and that would be okay. Or we'd use binders, um, Android's binder IPC mechanism to reflect things off IPC endpoints and get the data back to us and disrupt that that taint tracking. Um, but a lot of these things, like for example, the direct buffer interface on Java are very strange interfaces. They're very uncommon, so that even if, like, uh, even if we used it, it would be totally reasonable for Google to say, we're going to flag any app that's using direct buffer, because that's weird. You know, if someone's using this, we're going to flag it, and they might be trying to evade some of the um, taint tracking systems that we have in place. So um, that's about it. Um, there's a lot of things that you know, Google can do here and that hopefully they have done in the past, I don't know, six months, a year since we gave this presentation. Um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, such as hiding the obvious identifiers. Um, there's kind of um, some medium range things that are, are, can be fixed but are difficult. You know, we looked at the IP range that our requests came from. They're obviously Google network blocks. Um, but Google has a lot of experience in this area. Um, they have a, a program called uh, safe browsing, which crawls all the websites on the internet and sees whether websites are doing bad things when you visit them. Um, and so they have a lot of proxies and address space at um, providers all over the world. They could reuse that same address space, that diversity of, of IP address space to um, kind of make it more difficult for attackers to fingerprint exactly where these bouncer requests are coming from. Um, but then again, like when you really look at it, how do you convince an attacker or an attacker's application that it's running on a real device? Like think about your own device. You have all of your own pictures on there. You have all of your own contacts. You have your um, accelerometer data. You have your GPS data. Um, there's just so many attributes of a device that are very difficult to emulate in a dynamic and believable way um, to make it indistinguishable from you know, a real device that a, a user might have. Um, and this is, this is why, um, just in general, dynamic analysis, dynamic analysis is hard. It's a, a problem, again, that's kind of shared with traditional uh, computing and security. It's not really restricted to, to mobile devices. Um, it's never going to be perfect, but at the same time, um, it's not really, um, doesn't have to be perfect. If you're Google, and right now you're getting you know, crapped on in the press because you have tons of malware in your app store, if you can stop, 99% of those applications by implementing Bouncer, that's a huge win. Now, Charlie and I come along and we, you know, you know, poke a bunch of holes in your stuff and show how easy it is to bypass, and um, attackers aren't dumb. They follow security research. They're doing this stuff on their own as well, at least the smart ones. 
Um, and that kind of knowledge trickles down, whether it's from research, whether it's from um, actual adversaries who are publishing information or sharing information among their communities. And that will trickle down to the dumb malware developers too, where eventually you'll just have a library that you compile with your application that will bypass Bouncer. You know, malware authors like to reuse code just like all of us software engineers like to. Um, why write it yourself when you can have specialized teams or specialized resources or packages, software packages you can buy um, that will do it uh, for you. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can just be um, sort of good enough that uh, it, it stops a large swath of malware and as the malware, adapt, uh, malware authors are trying to adapt to Google Bouncer, Google's continually improving Bouncer. They're adding more sophistication. This was very much a kind of 1.0 version of Bouncer, um, as we've seen how kind of obvious some of the things were. I'd love to look back, you know, like a year later and see what they've improved upon. But again, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say it's intractable, but it's a, it's a very difficult problem um, from the defensive point of view. Um, the other thing was, uh, this was just a, a rant, um, partially because I had given a presentation at SummerCon in 2010 talking about why native code support on Android sucks and you don't actually have code signing. Um, I had actually in this presentation, I had talked about, you know, um, if you submit an iOS app, all the code that you submit to the app store is signed. And then when that app runs on the device, it can only run that same signed code that, you know, Google has kind of co-signed or cross-signed uh, for you. That makes static and dynamic analysis a lot easier. Um, what I showed in 2010 is that you can actually pull down new code at runtime when you're in an Android application. And apps like Facebook used to do that. Like, you know, you run the Facebook app and it would pull down like new Java jar files and execute them at runtime. You can also pull down native code. You can pull down, you know, your C that's compiled down to ARM or x86 and load those into your address space. And that makes it really hard to do dynamic analysis since you don't know what code is going to run at runtime. Um, if I detect that I'm running a bouncer, I don't pull down new code. If I'm running on a device, I pull down an exploit remotely and I use that. And bouncer has no visibility into that, that code that I just pulled down and executed. Um, and so I remember when I was giving this presentation, I was saying, you know, if Android ever did do any kind of static or dynamic analysis, actually having code signing would be a huge boon. Um, as it turns out, when I gave this presentation, they still hadn't done code signing. They just recently, I think like six months ago, introduced a change to their terms of service that says you can't do, you can't pull down new code at runtime. So they've kind of made steps towards that, which is a positive thing, um, but it's still a policy thing. They're saying, hey, Facebook, stop doing that because sometime in the future, six months, a year from now, we're actually going to cut this off at a technical level. Um, so they're kind of, you know, making slow progress towards that. It's also good for exploit mitigation. Um, if you do have code signing, it makes it more difficult to uh, sort of execute traditional memory corruption and control flow um, uh, hijacking attacks. So um, as I said already, uh, Bouncer doesn't have to be perfect. It's going to catch the crappy stuff. It's not going to catch the good stuff. Same as, you know, basically any other kind of um, blacklisting tool that's trying to detect badness on the internet. Um, our, our sort of final conclusion was that Bouncer didn't really raise the bar that much. Um, but again, it was a, obviously a 1.0 version from, um, from Google. So if you guys have uh, interest in this kind of stuff and have free cycles, um, certainly go buy some, some burners from CVS and poke at it yourself. Uh, this was, ah, see, yes, I was thanking Chris for, for hosting us, and yet he's not here. So that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Um, first, great talk. Uh, and my question was, there's a group of people at MySec who are doing a white paper on threat modeling, so if anybody's interested, it'd be great to join them. And uh, the, this one challenge they're running into is finding um, data of threats or attacks, like companies tend to keep it private. Mm -hmm. And so are there any public sources of information on, you know, attacks, or is there any way to clean that up and take a look at that? That's a good question. Um, the question if Martin didn't pick it up was, is there any sort of public sources or um, unbiased opinions about attacks? And that's, um, I don't know of, of many when it comes to mobile security. Um, there's certainly a lot of vendors who have a very 
vested interest financially in um, hyping up mobile security, talking about how many threats there are. You see reports like ah, 400,000 new Android malware threats last month. And then you see folks from Google and folks from the um, CTIA, sort of the carrier alliances, saying that's completely false. Um, but no one's willing to release their data. So the, the AV vendors say, well, we saw it, you know, and by how they define a unique threat is usually uh, kind of a, a very exact match. So if you have a piece of malware that's uh, packed 50,000 different ways, that's 50,000 different threats as opposed to just one thing that is obfuscated in a bunch of different ways. Um, and then Google doesn't want to put out anything publicly because they keep things, it keeps their, car, their cards close to their chest and they don't really want to admit um, sort of what's in their market versus what's in uh, foreign markets. Um, so it's a very, very challenging area for anyone to derive any sort of ground truth about what's actually going on. Um, I had a very heated debate um, on a panel with um, the folks from Google and um, uh, even Apple participated, um, CTIA. Um, we had done some research on uh, sort of the latent vulnerabilities on Android that don't actually get patched because there's a very sort of conservative patching process and complicated ecosystem for carriers and OEMs. And um, I was like, hey, look, we have actually hard data and stats that show that, you know, 70% of Android devices are vulnerable right now. And they said, well, okay, that's great. Like, you actually showed data. You know, we were one of the first people to be like, hey, we'll show you our, our data collection. We'll give the raw numbers. We're kind of an independent party. We're not, we don't have an agenda here. Um, it was a DARPA-funded project. We're just trying to sort of generate public awareness. Um, and they said, well, how many of those users are being attacked? Where's the malware? Where's the malware that's actually exploiting those vulnerabilities? We can show how easy it is, um, but is it actually happening in the real world? That's a legitimate question. So for mobile, it's very hard. Um, I think it's, it's much more understood on, on desktop platforms. Um, simply because the defensive solutions have much more visibility into those attacks and they can actually measure them in a more effective manner than on mobile devices. Thank you. Did you guys investigate emulator breakouts or any of those kind of attacks? That is a good question. So I actually hinted at that. Um, I didn't go too much in depth. Um, da, 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 da. There we go. Um, so. We, we were, um, you know, there, there is this piece of research from Woot a few years ago, um, which is a good, good uh, sort of academic slash practical industry conference on offensive technologies, um, where these folks were able to determine um, not only that something was running in an emulated environment, but they're actually able to determine what version of QEMU was running. So um, if you follow that kind of research, you probably remember like Joanna's like red pill software from years ago where um, you know she could fingerprint you were running VMware based on the sort of emulation of this the CPU instruction. Um, and so this paper was called a fistful of red, pull, red pills um, because they came up with an automated system that would take um, randomly generated C programs, compile them down, run them on a real piece of ARM hardware and run them on a Android emulator and then say, hey, we ran like all these instructions, all this kind of unique code. What did the registers look like after execution? And they'd say, oh, they don't match. You know, the, the code, uh, the, the processor instructions and the way that the um, uh, CPU handled them resulted in different output, essentially. Like the register state was the output of the test that they ran. And then they would go back and they'd analyze those test cases and say, oh, look, here's where QEMU did something wrong or did something different. And for most programs, it doesn't matter. But for these fuzzed test cases, um, they could exercise sort of unique behavior. And once you do that on a bunch of different versions of QEMU, you can run a program that says, oh, you're running QEMU 0.9, or I forget the QEMU versioning scheme. Uh, but you can actually identify that exact version. And if you know that exact version, you can say, well, you know, there's been kind of um, uh, hyperjacking attacks or jailbreaking attacks against QEMU where you might be able to pop out of the emulator mm -hmm. and actually be running on real Google infrastructure, the actual hardware that's emulating these systems, 
And then you're in a whole other world. <laughs> we didn't even want to go near that um, for our experiments, because that's when you get into you know, criminal space, um, as opposed to just messing around with uh, Google's lesser emulated systems. There's a, I don't really know where the legal and technical barrier there is, but there's a sort of understood um, sort of research angle of playing with these systems versus trying to directly take control of Google infrastructure and do something bad. Very good question, though. Anything else? One more question. Robbie. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I don't really have a question. You got to come up with one. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, which app store is more secure? So people will still say iOS. Um, I've had some fairly in-depth conversations with the Android security folks, and I know the kind of extent of analysis that they, they do beyond kind of the app submission. Um, and so it is, it is extremely sophisticated. I mean, you think, of, you think of all of the access that Google has to various services, to information. They can do really good fraud analysis. And that's kind of rolled up in, in Google Checkout. So. Um, I'm not saying that Apple doesn't have that same reach, but I think that there's just a lot of misconceptions that, well, I sign up for Apple, and they make me fax them my driver's license. And sure, Apple probably outsources that to a third party, and that third party will go through some verification process, check with the DMV, blah, blah, blah. But really, is that strong security? And is that kind of the resource constraint that an attacker has that, like, I can't get a picture? Yeah, I mean, faxes are really hard to send, so, you know, it's real pain. You feel like if you're, if you're going through pain, there must be security. Like, I have to do all this stuff. I have to take out my wallet and scan it, and it seems, yeah, it seems really official, and I've got to do a, a fax, and then I've got to wait a week before my app is approved. You know, you think that there's some security going on there, um, when in reality that might not be the case, and there's certainly been apps that have gotten through the review process um, that, you know, is curated. Um, Charlie submitted an application um, and he said that the hardest part of getting a malicious app into the iOS app store was actually finding a legitimate looking app to submit because he didn't want to do a lot of work. He's never written like a real mobile app himself. Um, so he said, hey, hey John, do you have any like real iOS apps you've written because I want to stuff my payload into it and then you know try to sneak it through the review <laughs> process. I've never written any legitimate apps either so I was like let me ask my buddy. Um, the first app they submitted was an app called um, Don't Hassle the Hoff. And if you've ever seen this, this GIF, it's an it's a animated GIF of Hasselhoff, like standing like this wearing a Speedo. And the app zooms in on his crotch. And then it's like another picture of Hasselhoff. And it's this kind of like endless zoom. Um, and so he submitted that application to the <laughs> iOS app store. And of course, it got rejected. Um, it said this was not like up to Apple's standards of applications, not because of security reasons, um, but because you know it was just this kind of like goofy app. Um, the funny part was my buddy who had developed that app had successfully submitted it to Apple like a couple years back and had gotten in, and he like made a decent amount of money from this really you know stupid application. Um, so we had to you know reach further back in our our uh, coffers and and get this stock quote app that again my my friend had written a few years back. And I thought it was interesting that, that Apple wasn't actually doing any kind of like binary comparison to say like, hey, this app has been submitted in the past and now it's being resubmitted, the same exact application, nearly the same application by a new developer. That might be interesting. Um, so it was an app called like Active Quotes. It was a stock quote app. And that was, it passed Apple's, you know, bar of, you know, this is like a legitimate app that you might want to submit. Um, and that's all it took. You know, it just took like a decent looking app and got in the app store and he was able to um, actually um, find an issue, a bug in Apple's process of, where is this? Apple's code signing process um, where he could actually load unsigned code at runtime and then pull down additional payloads um, that would then exploit the device. Or I think he used um, 
the iOS meterpreter payload, if you guys have used Metasploit before, which allowed them to remote control the device and pull off the address book and lots of other uh, sort of fun, um, fun hacks. So he's got a video of that online if you want. He recorded it like in his bedroom with like a series of mirrors uh, showing him in the phone. It's really uh, low quality, but that's, that's Charlie for you. Anything else? Awesome, guys. Well, thank you very much. So if you guys want to get in touch with Charlie, feel free to email him and tell him what a terrible presentation it was. My contact information is there.